and the information presented today may be subject to change. This presentation is focused on the preliminary design of post-tension concrete users, which is one superstructure option under study. First, we'll start off with a little bit of a project summary. The I-49 connector is a Louisiana Department of Transportation and Development project located in Lafayette, Louisiana. The project consists of a future five and a half mile segment of limited access highway that extends I-49 south from the intersection of I-10 through Old Lafayette to the Lafayette Regional Airport. The segment includes 2.75 miles of elevated freeway structures. At the time of the study, the elevated freeway included a total of 25 bridge units with 100 spans on each a northbound and a southbound structure. Units in the elevated freeway range from two spans up to six spans, and the width of the northbound and the southbound structures varied from 62 feet up to 119 feet due to on and off ramp access, as well as the number of lanes carried. AECOM has been tasked to create a bridge development report to study and compare three superstructure alternatives for the elevated freeway. The girder type has to be a closed trapezoidal shape. We looked at concrete U-girders, concrete segmental, and steel U-girders. The design team was given the choice of using pre-stressed or post-tension concrete U-girders. The caveat is that we have to maintain a minimum of 150-foot span in the freeway at all times. Now we'll talk about some of the design, specific design criteria and challenges that we face. AECOM prepared a design criteria document with input and acceptance by LADOTD. The criteria was based on the AASHTO LRFD Bridge Design Specification 7th Edition, with sections superseded by the LADOTD Bridge Design Evaluation Manual and Standard Specifications for Road and Bridge. The static loads for the superstructure are based on typical LA DOTD practices. We use the density of post-tension concrete at 155 pounds per cubic foot, future wearing surface of 25 pounds per square foot, and a standard 42-inch F-shaped barrier that weighs 521 pounds per lineal foot. The LA DOTD has a special live load condition called the Louisiana Design Vehicle Live Load 2011, LADV11. The LADV11 load is a product of the force effects produced by the AASHTO HL93 loading and a particular magnification factor found in the Bridge Design Manual. Bridge Design Manual section 3.6.1.2 shows these magnification factors. The factors change due to the conditions and the load type being investigated. For positive moment and shear in the girders, we are always using a factor of 1.3 due to the span length being less than 240 feet in length. For negative moment, the magnification factor we use varies between 1.0 and 1.3. This variation is based on span length and a linear interpolation equation for spans between 100 and 240 feet in length. The magnification factors are applied as multipliers to the live load. You can think of this in two ways. One would be as an additional factor on the live load, such as 1.3 times 1.75 for strength one. The second way would be to multiply the axle loads and the lane loads by the factor. Because we have differing magnification factors for positive and negative moments, we'll need to define two load combinations for each strength and service combination to check the force effects. Typical AASHTO lane definition and multiple presence, uses, multiple presence factors are used, and our live load deflection is limited to L over 800 using either the AASHTO design truck alone or 25% of the AASHTO design truck with design lane and no magnification factors. Some other typical loads include uniform temperature, creep and shrinkage, wind, centrifugal, braking, and dynamic live load allowance, all per the AASHTO LRFD spec. The bridge design manual has a load factor table that supersedes AASHTO table 3.4.1-1. The most significant change to the load factors is a service three live load factor of 1.0, increased from 0 0.8 in AASHTO. The 1.0 factor is based on experience in Louisiana and other states that indicates a trend in heavier highway vehicles in the HL93 load models. The design criteria specified compression strength of 6 KSI for post-tension concrete nominally reinforced and 8.5 KSI for precast, pre-stressed concrete girders. Our experience in Colorado suggests girder design mixes of at least 10 KSI are now easily attainable. Research into the precast market in the Gulf states confirmed they could also achieve these strengths. 
Based on our experience and research, we move forward using 10 KSI for the curves with a release strength of 7.5 KSI. This strength helps in all aspects of the design from higher release and temporary stress limits to increased moment and shear capacities. We assume that we could use shoring towers at each splice. There are a few exceptions in the plan to date that would require strong back, such as a railroad crossing. However, those exceptions can be resolved at a later design phase. The curvature of the superstructure is neglected in the MIDAS modeling because the horizontal curve radii are very large, varying from 5,300 up to 24,000 feet. The large radii allows us to use corded girders under the curved deck and makes the centrifugal force very small, at just 13 pounds per lineal foot. When we started this project, MIDAS had not released the version of Civil with the code checks for concrete, so we had to post-process all of our results. Allowable stresses were calculated based on AASHTO and the bridge design manual for the girders before and after losses. A visual inspection of the stresses from MIDAS at various construction stages would be checked against these values. Load calculations were prepared in advance of the MIDAS models, including the magnification factors for positive and negative moments, shear and reactions based on span lengths, and the bridge design manual tables. Now we'll take a look at the girder section that we developed for this project. We leaned heavily on our own experience here in Colorado and the pre-cast, pre-stress, and post-tension standards developed by the Florida Department of Transportation. FDOT has developed standards for pre-tension U-girder shapes that are published through the department. However, they did not have a published post-tension shape at the time of our design. Because FDOT did not have a published post-tension shape, we referenced the PCI Zone 6 standards for curved U-girders that were developed by both PCI and FDOT. The sheer size of the U-girders provides very good structural capacity in all aspects of design. However, the self-weight can become an issue. In discussion with area precasters, they would prefer to keep the weight of the pieces near 200 kips, which is similar to Colorado shipping and picking weights. They noted that they have picked and shipped units of up to 350 kips, but those require specialty rigging. They also mentioned that the heavier pieces are shipped easily by barge to a location that is close to the project site. The Colorado U-girder section for both pre-tension and post-tension units has the same outer dimensions and profiles. The girder section, section changes to accommodate post-tension tendons using inserts in the forms. Here we can also see the F-dot pre-tension U72 shape. This shape closely mimics the Colorado pre-tension shape, the primary difference being the lower flange is two inches wider. The size and shape of the upper flange is negligible when comparing the two as the upper formwork of the girder beds can accommodate a great variety of configurations. For the I-49 connector, we decided to move forward with the general F-dot pre-tension shape and extrapolate the size to accommodate post-tensioning. This decision was based on F-dot having published standards for the pre-tension u girder shape. This maximizes the long-term use of the shape as precasters may already have the formwork for the pre-tension shape and designers have a familiarity with the shape. The girder was increased in depth by moving the top flange upwards one foot and keeping the upper flange shape and web slope. The overall width of the girder increases six inches across the top flange. Web thickness was increased to nine inches based on cover required from the F-dot structures manual. We settled on using 12 6 tenths inch diameter grade 270 low relaxation strand post-tension tendons. F-dot structures manual table 4.5.5-3 requires a minimum of three tendon webs for the girders. We utilize the maximum of four tendons in each web. Four tendons make the anchorage zone easier to detail and stagger, and also allows us to post-tension all tendons before the deck board. From the VSL catalog, this strand arrangement has a duct diameter that measures 3.58 inches across the ribs. The girder web was set to nine inches thick based on F-dot structures manual table 4.5.6-1. The table requires a minimum of outer duct diameter plus two times the cover plus two times the stirrup dimension. Utilizing a 3.58 inch duct, two inch cover, and a number six stirrup, we end up with a calculation of 9.08 inches, setting the web at nine inches for detailing simplicity. In the section shown, the left side of the girder shows the tendons at mid-span, and the right side shows the tendons over the piers. Tendon center to center spacing is taken from F-dot structures manual table 4.5.5-1 for U-girders. The minimum center to center spacing based on the table would be the outer duct diameter plus two inches. 
resulting in attendance spacing of 5.58 inches. We elected to use 6-inch spacing for simplicity. The tendons are centered in the web to provide adequate cover and allowance for nominal reinforcing in the girder. Pre-tensioning is required to support the self-weight of the girders as they are released and shipped. FDOT requires that the pre-stressing resist all loads prior to post-tensioning, including a superimposed dead load equal to 30% of the weight of the piece. FDOT also requires that the pre-tensioned piece must have zero or positive camber at release. We can also count on the pre-stressing to help resist our positive moments after the girders are made continuous. The pre-stressing does counteract the negative moment resistance of the section and the post-tensioning over the piers. We try to utilize shorter sections over the piers to reduce weight and required pre-stressing, and longer sections for the dropping girders. And now we'll jump into the minus modeling. Rather than model all 50 units for all segments, we created a unit matrix to determine the worst case units. The worst case was judged by girder spacing as well as maximum span within a unit. Units are typically balanced well so that the exterior spans are 60 to 80 percent of the length of the interior spans. It's also typical that the largest girder spacing is in the exterior spans due to the flare of the deck. We chose to build four models, a two-span, a three-span, greater than three-span, as well as one control model that had no variance other than span length. The units chosen all come from the northern segment of the freeway. Our control unit was Unit 10 on the northbound bridge with a maximum span of 190 feet and a girder spacing of 15.17 feet. This is the unit we'll be looking at in detail today. For a two-span unit, we chose northbound Unit 5 due to a uniform girder spacing of 14.38 feet. The average girder spacing on the southbound unit is only 14.33 feet. For the three-span unit, we chose northbound unit 15 due to a 180-foot span and a girder spacing of 19.17 feet. For the greater than three-unit span, we chose southbound unit 13 with a maximum span of 200 feet and a maximum girder spacing of 15.04 feet. This is a unit we'll be looking at later for the flared girder modeling. Here's a look at the same unit matrix for the southern segment. You can see that for a two-span unit, the spans are shorter and the girder spacing narrower than the northern segment units. There is a single three-span unit on the northbound bridge. While this three-span has a larger girder spacing in the exterior span, the exterior span is shorter than the northern segment. We decided that a longer span with a slightly tighter girder spacing would be worse case than a shorter span with larger spacing. The LADOTD U84 girder was drawn in AutoCAD and exported to DXF format for importing the MIDAS. AutoCAD also has a handy feature called Mass Properties that calculates the geometric properties of a shape so we can confirm the import and MIDAS build are correct. Typically, FDOT and other transportation authorities require the use of a lid slab on the girder, especially for curved girders. Our level of design did not include an intermediate step for the lid slab, rather included the entire deck slab portion for the composite section. Here we see the girder imported into the MIDAS section property calculator and the two parts defined, the girder itself and the deck slab. The resulting build of the girder from the section property calculator will be used in the section definition of the models. After the girder section has been imported and built with the section property calculator, we need to bring it into the actual MIDAS model. We do this by defining a section using the Section Properties dialog and importing the Section Property Calculator data. We do this for the girder alone and for the composite section. Here we see the girder and its section properties, all of which can be verified through the AutoCAD tool or the Section Property Calculator. And here is one of the composite sections. We import the girder properties from the section we just defined, and then we can add the deck by inputting the dimensions. In the detailed model we'll be looking at, I've defined four composite girder sections, two each for the pier girder and two for the drop-in girders. While we only have two unique composite sections, one for the exterior and one for the interior, defining separate interior and exterior sections for both the pier pieces and the drop-in pieces makes it easier to keep track of for construction staging later. Because we are going to build multiple models of different units, I took the time to set up a blank model with all of my non-variables already defined, saving time for each subsequent model. I only need to build the girder section once as we use the same section for every unit. Concrete strength and time dependencies were calculated and saved in the material properties. 
Pre- and post-tension material properties were created. However, the profiles associated with the tendons were not. Areas of pre-stressing and profiles of pre- and post-tensioning would be defined in the model later. Since LADOCD has a special live load case, I created a special load definition by copying the HL93 load and applying the magnification factors as necessary. The magnification check factors will change depending on the span lengths as we saw previously, but having the load case already defined, it's easy to go to the load and change the value. There is a long list of load combinations between ASHTO and LADOTD, and they can take a long time to define. I created them all in the blank document so that future models would already have them, and all I need to do is assign loading values. This screenshot shows the live load definition for the LADV11 loading. On the left is a truck and lane defined with a magnification factor of 1.3 for the positive moment loading. And on the right is a truck and lane defined with a magnification factor of 1.19 for negative moment loading. The magnification factor is applied as a multiplier to the axle and lane load. The LADV11 load would already be defined in our blank document, and the magnitude of the load only needs to be changed per the unit that we're modeling. This screenshot shows the strand properties for both the pre- and post-tension in the girders. The shot on the left shows the definition for a single post-tension tendon with 12 6 tenths inch diameter strands. The material properties and various loss-defining factors are also defined. The unit model only then needs to have the total number of tendons defined as well as their profile paths. The shot on the right is the pre-tension strand definition. Since we are modeling only straight strand in the U-girders, we made the simplification of defining a single tendon of large area and diameter. This area and diameter would only be updated per the pieces modeled. We also need to define the centroid of these per piece. As I did with the blank document, I created a bridge wizard template file. Any information the wizard needs to pull from our material and section definitions is already in here. We only need to define our spans and piece layouts which change for each unit. I also found it helpful to save my wizard file for each unit that I created. During our introduction to the program, I found that if a girder line needed to be added or girder spacing needed adjusted, it was difficult to do after the wizard had already produced the model. The easiest way to rebuild was to open a new model and adjust those portions in the bridge wizard and rebuild from there. The downside to doing it this way was that any pretension, post-tensioning, or other girder dependent elements would also need to be redefined. Moving further into the bridge wizard, we come to the section definition tab. Since we have started with a blank model and wizard template, all of our materials and sections are already defined. The only thing we need to do here is update our girder number and spacing and our piece layout. The piece layout includes a section break at the pier, even though that piece is continuous when constructed. The length of the pieces is cumulative as you work your way along the girder. After the section tab, we get to the tendon tab. Here we can see that the wizard has correctly built our splice location and our stand configuration. I did not use this tab to define my pre-stressing or post-tensioning. Instead, I used the tendon loads tool to generate the profiles, which we'll look at a little bit later. Moving into the loads tab, the before and after composite section loads are pretty easy and quick to define. When we go to the live loads, all we need to do is define a moving load case and traffic lane. Our vehicles have already been created and updated with the correct magnification factor for the unit we are modeling. Finally, we get to the construction staging tab. I left the default stages as they were, and I would further define them in the construction loads. We do need to define the splice construction sequence. In this model, we have two pier pieces constructed in the first stage, and the drop-in pieces constructed in the second stage. We also need to define our temporary support condition. Because we have towers at all splices, we simply move all four splices into the false work box. And here is the output by the bridge wizard. We'll first take a look at Unit 10 on the northbound bridge. This is our control unit. In this print, you can see both the southbound and northbound bridges, their pier locations, and girder lines. For Unit 10, we have a span configuration of 150, 190, 160 feet, and a typical girder space in a 15.17 feet. You can also see the slight curvature in the freeway that was neglected at this level of design for the reasons mentioned earlier. This slide shows the typical section of Unit 10 northbound as well as the piece layout for modeling the Midas. I try to locate the splices as near an inflection point as possible to minimize the moment at that location. The splices are a lower strength concrete than the girders and inherently have a lower capacity. 
Peace lanes for this unit were 87 feet for the pier sections and 106 and 110 feet for the drop-in sections. At 87 feet, the pier sections weigh in at just over 201 kips. The maximum piece length of 110 feet weighs in at 254 kips. This maximum weight is slightly above what are targeted, but well within the shipping capabilities of precasters within the Gulf region. Here we see the base model for Unit 10 from Midas. As we are looking at this, the green dots are the pier locations, and the black and green dots are the shoring tower locations. Here is the first stage of the construction of Unit 10, the pier sections. As you can see, they are supported at the pier and on the shore towers, shoring towers. At this point, the girders are only subject to the pre-stressing and self-weight loading. Next come the drop-in pieces for the three spans. We are still supported on the shoring towers at this point, as we have not made the girders continuous. After the drop-in pieces are constructed, we can stress our tendons and make the girders continuous. The fun thing about doing new girders is the tendon profile definition is done in three dimensions due to the web slope, rather than two dimensions as would be in a bolt tee where the web is vertical. Finding the post-tension layout was by far the most time-consuming aspect of the design. The tendons are tied to the girder element, so there's not a good way to copy the profile from girder to girder, since all girders are built by the wizard before we get to this point. The good news is that the profile for each girder is exactly the same. So we only need to do the math one time, but we still need to select each girder line and apply the tendon geometry. I use the pre-stress loads portion of the program, specifically the tendon profile, to define the tendon profile. As mentioned earlier, defining the tendon in this manner was more intuitive to myself. The nice thing about using this tool in Midas is that you can do all of your calculation work in Excel and copy the cells into the tool. It's really made things easier for the initial profile setting or if I wanted to adjust it lay anything later in the design. We still need to go into each girder for the definition, but with copy and paste it goes somewhat quickly. We've already created the tendon property in our blank model, so all we need to do is define the geometry. I define the tendon at the anchorage and at each point where there is a change in curvature. By using the spline curve type and a zero inch straight length of tendon, the curves start at the point defined and our tangent at that location. Straight sections of the tendon are tangent between two points with the same y or z dimension. The tendon is tied to the girder by an element definition. This is a list of all the tendons and strands within this model. We have eight tendons per girder line and one pre-stressing pre strand per girder piece. With the use of the spreadsheets and the ability to copy and paste into the tendon profile tool, the time it took to define all these tendons was greatly reduced and very redundant. You're looking at the profile for tendon 1A in the girders, which would be the bottommost tendon, with geometry defined using an Excel spreadsheet. The X dimension of the line is the longitudinal dimension along the continuous girder line. The Y dimension is measured from the centroid out transversely. You can see that the Y dimension varies along the length of the girder. This is due to the slope of the girder web. The Z dimension is measured from either the top or the bottom of the girder section. This dimension changes with the profile of the duct along the length of the girder. The Y and Z dimensions give us the three-dimensional tendon profile as we have to account for both the transverse location of the tendon as it moves up and down in the sloped web. Here's a shot of the tendon profile in 3D. You can see that the tendon is located in the bottom of the girder in the positive moment regions and at the top of the girder in the negative moment regions. This shot also shows how the tendon moves in the Z dimension over the piers and also flares at the anchorage zone. The shape of the tendon is pretty generic at this point in design and can be optimized during the later design phase. Lastly, a shot of the tendon from the end of the girders. This shot really shows how we must think in three dimensions when defining a tendon in the U-girders. You can also see from the labels that this unit has four tendons in each web for a total of eight tendons in each girder. We have to calculate and define all eight tendon profiles for the program. And here we see the definition for the pre-stressing strand used in the exterior girder of the drop-in piece. The pre-stressing needs to be defined per piece as it acts on that specific piece and is not continuous across the entire girder length. Pre-stress and post-tension loads are defined using the tendon pre-stress tool. Load cases and groups have been defined previously to help keep track of when and how they are applied. It's been a process of selecting every tendon and strand that we have already defined and adding a load to them. Both the pre-stress and post-tension have a stress of 202.5 KSI applied at the time of jacking. 
The pre-stress is jacked from one end while the post-tension is jacked from both ends. I use the construction stage tool to model the various stages of construction for our unit. The stages are pretty standard and simplified for these analyses. We did not go into a stage for the stressing of each tendon in each girder. It was assumed that the tendon would be stressed from each end and in a symmetric pattern to balance the loads. I always add a stage to my models for the wet deck condition when the girders are continuous but not composite and must carry the weight of the deck as wet concrete before it is cured. This load is added in stage four and removed in stage five as the composite section already includes the dead weight of the cured deck. The last three stages are the completed bridge with various loading combinations. Stage five models the bridge as complete but not yet open to traffic and only subject to static loads. This stage helps identify the stress conditions that some design criteria require for static loads, such as no tension in a pre-compressed zone. The last two stages, six and seven, model the bridge with full live load for all of the service and strength loading combinations, as well as the long-term effects of losses on our bridge. We expand on the construction stages defined in the bridge wizard through the construction stage loading tool. Here we are able to add specific elements, boundaries, and loads to each stage. It's necessary to create our own groups of these items to help in the sorting and application. In this particular screenshot, we have added the peer supports, the peer pieces, and the shoring towers. We also need to check our composite sections for our construction stages. We do this through the composite section tool for CS tool. In this tool, we can define which sections to apply to particular stages as well as the parts within those sections. The screenshot shows a peer girder being defined in the active stage, which is the peer girder stage and the deck part of the composite section being added in the cured deck phase. Here are two construction stages that show the pre-stressing of the dropping girders and the post-tensioning of the girders. Pre-stressing loads are applied on the first day of the stage to simulate the loading as the pieces are removed from the casting bed. The post-tension loads are applied on the last day of the stage, simultaneous with releasing the beam ends for continuity and removing the shoring towers. In the cured deck stage, we are removing the wet deck load that was applied to the continuous girders on the non-composite section. In the dead load stage, we are adding all of our static loads. The bridge is complete at this point, and now we can check our loads and stresses and long-term conditions. Finally, we get to the results of all our model building. Here we see the stresses at the top of the girder just after post-tensioning and making the girders continuous. The shoring towers have also been removed at this stage. Our girder section is in compression along its entire length of the top, owing to the fact that our only loading is the pre-stressing, post-tensioning, and self-weight. As would be expected, the stress over the piers at the top of the girder has the highest compression value due to the duct profile and the concentration of PT force. And here we see the stresses at the bottom of the girder just after post-tensioning. Our girder section is in compression along its entire length at the bottom. This means our girder section is in compression, which is expected with the amount of post-tensioning applied to resist later loads. The stress at the middle of the spans has the highest compression value due to the duct profile and the concentration of PT force. The stresses were checked at the top and bottom of the girder at the service one and service three load combinations. This is the stress at the top of the girder under the service one condition with the LADV11 positive moment magnification. Remember that this magnification is increased in our live loads and our combinations. We are checking that the compression stress does not exceed our limits at any point. We would expect the largest compression stress at the top of the girder to be in the center of the spans, which is what the results show. This is the stress at the bottom of the girder under the service one condition. When checking the stress at the bottom of the girder, our largest compression stress will occur at the piers under the negative moment envelope. Moving on to checking the tension stresses under the service three combination, we are looking at the stress at the top of the girder under the negative moment envelope. The LADV11 negative moment magnification increases the live loads in our combination. The negative moment envelope creates the largest moments and stresses at the piers at the top of the girder. Here we can see that we are still in a compression state at those locations. And looking at the bottom of the girder under service three load combination, here we would expect the largest moments to be at the middle of the spans due to the positive moment envelope. And looking at the results, we see a tension stress of 299 PSI in the center of the middle span. The location of this tension is where we would expect it to be. 
Here are the results of our stress check for this unit. As you can see, the Service 1 checks for compression are well under the limits. For the Service 3 tension check, the stress at the top of the girder is in compression. At the bottom of the girder, our 299 PSI comes in just under the tension limit of 300. Now that all of our stresses have been checked, we can move on to moments. Here we are looking at the maximum positive moments generated by the LADV11 positive moment magnification factor at the strength 1 combination. Strength 1 just happened to govern, but we did model all of our strength combinations. As is expected, the largest positive moments are at the middle of the spans. And here we are looking at the maximum negative moments generated by the LADV11 negative moment magnification, also at the strength 1 combination. As is expected, the largest negative moments are over the piers. As I mentioned earlier, we used the version of Midas Civil just before they included the concrete code check. To check our moments, we used the strain compatibility method to compute the capacities of our section. For the positive moments, we relied on the composite section and the added compression flange that the deck provided. The deck area was reduced by the modular ratio of the two different concrete strengths of the girder and the deck. The blue lines here represent the calculated moment capacity of the girders at quarter points. The red lines represent the output data from MIDAS at those same quarter points. For the negative moment capacity, we relied on the girder section alone and did not include the deck and the rebar. The blue lines here represent the calculated moment capacity of the girders at quarter points. The red lines represent the output data from MIDAS at those same quarter points. And now we'll take a look at Unit 13 on the southbound bridge. This is the greater than three span unit we modeled with flared girder lines. In this print, you can see both the southbound and northbound bridges, the pier locations, and the girder lines. The girder lines flare along the entire length of the unit. We maintained the overhang distance on the exterior girder and varied the spacing of the interior girders at the piers. This print also shows how the ramps are integrated. Where the ramps tie in, we, we located the pier at the gore area so that the ramps would be on their own structures after the concrete deck separates. For Unit 13, we have a span configuration of 165, 200, 190, 160 feet. The girder spacing varies from 11.7 up to 15.04 feet. This slide shows the typical section of Unit 13 southbound as well as the piece layout for modeling in Midas. Piece lengths vary for this unit from 85 feet to 100 feet for the pier sections and 100 feet to 110 feet for the drop-in sections. It's important to note where our splices are located in the layout for the MIDAS model. Here's the base model in MIDAS looking down from the top. We can clearly see that the flare of the girder lines and the edge of the deck. The first thing we need to do is lay out our girder lines in AutoCAD. This is pretty quick and easy since we have already drawn the bridge layout in the CAD program for our plan sheets. The file is saved as a DXF file for import into MIDAS. Now we import the DXF drawing into MIDAS. I've imported the DXF as nodes only because I will add the elements later. I do it this way rather than importing an element because I want to keep my node and element numbering in sequential order so that it's easier to define the pre-stressing and post-tensioning tendons later. Next, we start to create elements, applying our section and material properties already defined in the blank model. We work between nodes and then subdivide the element, keeping in mind that we need to divide the present element before drawing the next one. We subdivided our first girder in five-foot increments and created the girder in the second span. The five-foot increments will help us identify which node the splice lands on. Now we have all of our nodes and elements needed for the girder definition. There are a total of 720 nodes and 715 elements in this model now. In the inset, you can see that our elements and nodes are numbered sequentially as we have built them, other than the imported nodes from AutoCAD. The pier center line is shown on nodes 2, 16, and 14 with the black line. We also need to define our supports at this stage. We define our tendons in the same manner as we did before, tying them to the elements and using the offsets calculated from the spreadsheet. The arrow points to the assigned elements portion of the tendon profile. This is why it's important to build the model the way we did and keep the elements in sequential order. Pre-stressing is also assigned using this tool and only applied to the elements that we know are included in each piece. The next step is to add nodes and elements to particular groups so that we can use those in our construction stages. 
This is pretty simple. Just create a new group and assign the nodes and elements that we want to the group. Here we are looking at the fully defined post-tension tendon for our flare cooker unit. And here's a detailed look at the tendons in the, in, in the exterior span. The composite section for this model is defined for each girder piece using an average width deck over that piece. Here we see the definition for the exterior girder drop-in piece between piers 2 and 3. The deck was tied together with links to ensure we had full composite action when modeled. This slide shows the same construction stages we had in our last model. And we are activating the pier girder elements and their supports. We are also activating the shoring towers and the beam in releases. The remainder of the model build follows our last example. We need to finish the grouping of all our nodes and elements and create our construction stages. Lastly, we need to run the analysis and check our results. And finally, we'll take a look at a few of the results from our flared girder model. Here we are looking at the stress at the top of the girder at the service one with negative moment magnification. We see the highest concentration of compression in the middle of the spans. Even though we are checking service one in this view, you can see there is a small amount of tension at the middle pier due to the negative moment. Here is the stress at the bottom of the girder at service three with a positive moment magnification. We expect to see tension in the bottom of the girder at the middle of the spans, which we do in the second span. Here's a shot of the strength one load combination with a positive moment magnification. As is expected, our largest moments are at the center of the span. And lastly, here's a shot of the strength one load combination with a negative moment magnification with our largest moments over the piers. This was my first project using the Midas Civil software, and there was a pretty good learning curve to go along with it. The bridge wizard proved to be invaluable when I had to recreate models due to errors in input or design or changes such as girder spacing and span length. These recreates are also what led me to save both the blink model document and the wizard template. There are a number of ways to build your models and create your construction staging. The ways I presented here today were the most intuitive to myself. Looking back on the models and refreshing myself for the presentation, with the experience I gained, I would have liked to model the bridges with the proper curvature and the quarter girders, as well as model a few more units with flared girder lines. I would have also added a lot of definition in my construction staging to model the post-tension jacking sequence. A special thank you to Jay and Angela of Midas for putting this webinar together and to Jenny for her guidance on the project and presentation. Thank you all for joining me today, and now we'll take some questions. Thank you, Doug. Uh, we already have a few of the questions submitted, so I'm going to start sharing my screen now. Okay. Okay. This is the first slide of the questions. Um, Doug, can you actually go over them and answer two? Absolutely. So the first one is the tendon continuous over a span of girder. The tendon is continuous from one end of the girder to the other based on the element definition that we use. So by using the tendon profile tool, if we have a, a girder line that is defined as elements 1 to 200, if our profile is defined from elements 1 to 200, it's applied to all of those elements and it's continuous over the length of the girder. How do we apply temperature loads on the tendons? It's a very good question and I actually did not model that in mine. Um, there are ways to allow to apply temperature loads and tendon loads. Um, the way I would probably do it is to apply a separate load on the tendon based on a hand calc for the temperature. Do we have to remove jacking force at any construction stage or not? My answer would be no. We apply an initial force that represents the jacking in the tendon pre-stress loads. That would be our 202.5 KSI. And then with time dependencies of our materials in the model, the model actually calculates our losses based on anchorage, friction, and um, creep, shrinkage, elastic gains, elastic losses, and long-term losses. So 
So the, the program does all of that for us. Are effective sections due to a shear lag used for stress check? So at this level of design, we simply use the AASHTO section 4 portion of the code for our stress check, basically just doing the um, 0.316 F prime C equation where we calculated the depth of the girder and the size of the, the flange and then calculated the stress from that area. Okay. Is there another slide? Yes. There we go. Are the U-girders match cast at the splice locations? Yes. The splice matches the girder shape both on the inside and the outside. We can add a little bit of concrete on the inside if needed, but generally the, the formwork is um, an exact match to the girders. Does the pretensioning use harp strands or debonded strands? In this model, they did not. Um, I have done other U-girder designs where we use both harp strands and debonded strands. It really just depends on what your um, capacities needed are and what your requirements are. Did you include crack properties of deck plate above the support? We did not include that at this level of design. Was redecking case considered? As in for the final phase, was the deck removed and the girders checked for overstress during the redecking process? So redecking was considered. We did not include a final phase where we pull the deck off and check the stress. What we did was we, we stressed all eight tendons in the ducts before the deck was cast, and that essentially checks our stresses in the girder um, before that deck is cast. So we still have all of that compression force in the girders without a deck. So we did check it, just not at the final phase. We checked it at the initial phase. Okay, that was the end of the questions. Um, if you, if Great. see there are a couple more being submitted, um, but we'll follow up on the remaining questions. And um, okay. Doug, thank you so much for the great presentation and sharing your experience. And everyone attending the webinar today, I hope we get to meet through another webinar in future. Thank you for all of your time and have a nice day. Thank you, Angela. Thank you, Doug. <laughs> have a great evening. Bye.